Hi guys, it's Tony Robbins. You're listening to Habits and Hustle. Crush it. Alan Castell is a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles. He studies learning, memory, and aging, and is interested in how people can selectively remember important information. He received his PhD from the University of Toronto, did a fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis, and has been at UCLA since 2006. He lectures internationally to people of all ages and has received several teaching awards. His work has been featured in the New York Times and Times Magazine, Time Magazine. His new book is entitled Better With Age, The Psychology of Successful Aging. And we have him here. So hello, Alan. Nice to have you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Oh, so great. I, I, I really enjoyed your book. And, uh, you know, what I what I really like about your book and about your whole philosophy, there's no real smoke and mirror, just really kind of really like brass tacks of what things really are. Um, and so let's just dive right into it. The psychology of aging and how to age well. Um should we start with memory? Because I think memory kind of is a very, it kind of correlates nicely with aging. Sure. And I think anytime you talk about aging, people immediately say, oh no, I'm starting to forget names. Does this mean I have Alzheimer's disease or what yes. can I do? And usually, you know, when we start to notice these challenges, there's are things we can do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean we have dementia, but it's good to pay attention to your mind and your body to notice you know, is this a name that I know very well, but I just can't access right now? Is it on the tip of my tongue? Or is it a name that I never really got in the first place? And so even coming over here, I had to refresh myself. It's <laughs> Jennifer, not Jessica. I know, could you, I think you did call me Jessica a few yes, times when we first met. because I have met. a sister named Jessica and there's, you know, similarities. So you almost have to override all of these. And as you get older, there's just more in your brain. There's more Jennifer's, there's more Jessica's. Right. And so these names are very familiar. So it's in some ways a retrieval challenge. Right. It's not that I never encoded your name. It's that I just can't retrieve the precise name at this time. Well, okay. I want to uh, let, let's. There's two parts to that. The two things I wanted to ask you. Number one, is there an age that we do naturally see a decline in these things? Is there an approximate? I mean, I know everybody's different, and we, we're going to get into all the different tra brain trainings mm -hmm. or ways and tricks we can maybe like help our memory. But is there a, a point in our life uh, that it does start to be a concern? Well, it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. And like right. you say, different people, and that's kind of the exciting part of the psychology aspect that right. we can put off how long before we experience really staggering declines. But I think what's striking and probably surprising to most people is th these declines can start as early as the age of 20. And oh, wow. Yeah. And I don't think we notice it because they're subtle. You know, right. they're, they're not changing. But by the time we're 30 or 40 or when we're multitasking or distracted, then we notice it even more. Mm -hmm. So I think in our middle to older age, <laughs> uh, we start to think when we're multitasking, we write it off as, well, I, I didn't sleep well or I'm multitasking. Um, so when we, people are 50 or 60, they might start to notice some sharper declines. And that's when people become concerned. Is this dementia? Is there something I can do about it? And of course, I'm not a neurologist. And so if you are very concerned, you can get objective tests mm -hmm. to see. But oftentimes people are just very concerned. And we refer to this as the worried well. You're worried about these changes, but for the most part, it's just kind of natural, normal aging. And it's not something to be terribly concerned about, but there are things we can do earlier in our lives to ensure that we have a good memory later. So that's what I wanna talk about. What can we do earlier in our life to help our memory in the later years? Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing. And as a psychologist, I'm gonna emphasize things that I think are very important. Okay. Um, having said that, sometimes the best advice or some advice you get is to pick your parents wisely, meaning that there's some sort of genetic component to all of this. Right. And there certainly is, you know, genetics do play a big role, but I think our lifestyle and that things that we do can play as big a role, if not more, because we have control over them. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing you can really do is engage in some sort of lifestyle habit that you can take with you for the rest of your life. And probably the best thing to jump right ahead <laughs> that you can do to ensure you have a good memory. A lot of people think it's brain training and brain, you know, stimulating your brain is great. Speaking in another language, doing crossword puzzles. But by and large, the best thing you can do is physical exercise. And the mind and the body are intimately connected. And a lot of research, really good research that randomly assigns people to stretch or mm -hmm. walk over you know, several months 
finds that the, the group that walks three to four times a week for 40 minutes does better on many tests of memory up to a year later. And the part of the brain that's really involved in memory, the hippocampus, which tends to decline by about 1% after the age of 50. So it starts to shrink and that accounts for a lot of these memory decline. In the group that was walking, actually their hippocampus increased in volume by 2% after the first year. So this gives evidence oh, that wow. you know, physical exercise plays a big role both in the brain structure, but then in, in performance, how well you can remember information. And, you know, these studies are ongoing and, you, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to increase the size of your hippocampus by 2% <laughs> every year. But the people who benefit the most are the people who are doing the least. So if you're already physically active, great. But if you aren't, you can really harness your brain by engaging in physical exercise. Okay, so then what happens with people who are already phys like physically active? <laughs> well, that's right? where you want to have ma maintenance and kind of keep it going. Okay. And, you know... Walking is one way to do it. There's many different things we can do, swimming, biking, running, and it really depends on the lifestyle. You keep ping pong, you know, some people are going to get into different things. And I think variability is good. You don't want to do just one thing. So if you're always walking, that's great, but then maybe try doing something different. So I, I've actually started to, you know, sometimes on my longer walks, I'll walk backwards for a little bit. Mm. Now I'm using different muscles and I, it's challenging. I do that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it, it's almost like half your body gets a, a bit of a break. You have to be careful you don't trip and hit right. something, but it's challenging. So I think those are kind of the key things is this, you know, routines where you're doing physical exercise, but still challenge yourself. And that's just one way to do it. There, there's many things you can do. Of all the podcasts, I would have loved to do this one <laughs> right. on the treadmill of for that course. exact reason, yes. because I know you say the number one, uh, I wouldn't say secret, but the number one thing you can do to improve how you age is walking. I mean, yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big fan. I'm a, I'm a big believer. Unfortunately, I did hurt my knee. <laughs> yes. So now we're sitting in my kitchen. Right. Um, but um, I always heard also that it's funny that you say that crossword puzzles, mind games, brain games like that is not the number one thing that helps with your aging process. And it is physical activity because you, you, I think we've all been told and seen that it's those crossword puzzles that are the most important thing to kind of keep your brain active or like alert, right? Absolutely. And I think anecdotally, that's what a lot of people will share. People who have very sharp minds and older age yeah. might say, well, I, I always do the New York Times crossword puzzle or I do it every day. And the truth is that might be beneficial, but there's no really good research that shows that that is the one thing where we randomly assign people to do crossword puzzles versus not. You, you just can't really do those studies. And what's interesting is what actually tends to get better with age is verbal knowledge. So as we get older, we accumulate more verbal abilities. Mm. We're, we're better at communicating and proficiency using language. So in a way, that crossword puzzle is strengthening a strength. Mm -hmm. Like it's good you're retrieving kind of lower frequency words and challenging yourself, but that's right. something that you actually can do pretty well in older age. So I always say, look, if crossword puzzles, if you get excited and you enjoy them, keep doing them, that's great. But that doesn't mean that's the one thing you should be doing. You should be challenging your brain in other ways, learning another language, doing something else. And don't forget about physical exercise because right. the truth is there's probably not just one thing you need to do. Um, there's probably many things. And that's kind of how you train your brain is by variability, trying new things, keeping healthy habits. So it's, it's likely a collection of a lot of things. And I think probably the key, and we'll probably return to this at the end, is balance. Yeah. That you shouldn't just be going on these five mile runs every day or a 10 mile walk every day. You know, maybe some variability, walk, run, swim, bird watch, crossword puzzles. Um, and interaction with other people is really important. Right. They say that socialization is the other really big one right. for people as they age. But in a, in a time like now, right, when we're all in this pandemic, you know, this is my first day back doing a live kind of in-person thing. You're my second guest. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a major issue with isolation right now, right? Because people haven't been able to socialize as they should, right? Yeah. And because of that, there are higher rates of depression and all these other things. And mm -hmm. when for the people who are older, how do they, what's like, what's an outlet they can do when they're, I, mean, I guess you're gonna say Zoom calls or <laughs> calling their family and friends on the phone, but sure. that human interaction is so important. Like, I think it's important for people of all ages. Yeah. And in fact, you know, we think of older adults as being vulnerable, you know, for a lot of things, but it's actually a lot of younger people who are experiencing a lot of mood changes, oh, loneliness and anxiety 
that might not be expected. Whereas we're, we're used to older adults, not used to, but you often think of as older adults being more isolated and lonely. And some, some of the recent research we've done as well has shown that older adults are actually fairly resilient. They're not a big fan of social isolation and right. not seeing their family and grandchildren, but they've also lived through things in life that are much worse than this, let's right, say. Right, right. And so when they look sense. back on their lives, they can say, look, this is not ideal and I don't like it, but I've also lived through things that have been much worse or I haven't had as much control over. So I think it's interesting to look at this both from a perspective of a younger person and adult who might be caring for an older person and an older person because the lens might be very different. We're, right. We all might experience this isolation or loneliness, but right. communicate it differently and might have different needs. You know, Not everyone needs a Zoom call every week. Sometimes a phone call might be good or just seeing someone on the street, even if they're further away, just having that sort of you know face to face, but not you know close distance uh, might be useful or even writing a letter, like a lot of people are now <laughs> sending mail yeah. again, <laughs> or, yeah. you know, email someone you haven't been in touch with in a long time, because now you have a flexible schedule, or you want to see how they're doing. Um, so, you know, I've had a few family uh, reunions by zoom, and they're, they're both interesting, but they've also been a good seed for me to then follow up with that one person I hadn't seen in yeah. a couple of years and, and send them an email or, or find a way to talk on the phone. So well, you said something again that about uh, how it actually is that people, especially in this pandemic, the the um, maybe the anxiety, the loneliness, the isolation feeling uh, is more. It's happening more than to a younger generation. Because I know in your book, which was very surprising to me, was that you did say even without a without a pandemic that the aging population is, ha it, you know, in all the research happier than the younger generation, which yeah. I found to be another thing. I was like, kind of like, oh, I, I'm learning so much, you know, great information this way. Cause well, that's very much why I wrote this book is to talk about some of these myths or stereotypes yeah. we have about old age. And a lot of people, first of all, want to um, avoid old age. We hide our wrinkles and dye right. our hair. So physically, it might not be very appealing. But and we're, we're scared. And of we're it. scared yeah. of it. We're scared of, you know, losing friends and family. Um, on the other hand, people who live a healthy life into old age are surprisingly happy, for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, these are averages, and have a lot of life satisfaction, you know, they've lived a long life. So they, they, that mood might be different than a younger person who's not sure of their life, mm -hmm. what they're going to do might be anxious. Um, and so this might stem from what's known as this positivity bias, that as we get older, we focus more on the positive things, um, positive information, positive stories, surround ourselves with the people we care about. Have you met my mother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all have a case study that we could analyze. And, um, you know, I think it makes us think, like, what will old age be like for me? Right. And right. I think we all would hope we have some control over it, that we don't get it, you know, cancer or dementia. And from a psychological standpoint, if we can avoid those sorts of things. I think we do have a lot of control over it and we can do a lot of things to enhance our mood. Um, and what may, some, some of these are biases, like you really do look away mm -hmm. from negative things or don't wanna be around people who are negative. And we also have to be careful not to get scammed because the flip side of this positivity bias is if someone calls you up and you're a little lonely mm -hmm. and is offering you these wonderful opportunities to get rich, you might think, you know, maybe I should, you know, follow up on these sorts of things. And that can be really disastrous. Right. Is it more naivety or just like inability to kind of, <sighs> yeah. you know, or you're just not, uh, yeah, or you just, you, 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 you tend to look at the glass half, the glass half full. That might be part of it. So I think don't... as we get older, we do tend to trust people more mm -hmm. or want to trust people. Um, but what's interesting is in terms of scams, telephone scams and email, internet scams, Often it's people with advanced degrees who are more likely to be scammed. And you'd think it's just the opposite. Like if your father or mother has a law degree or was an accountant, yeah. you think, oh, of course, they're an engineer. They could think their way through why this wouldn't be the case. But the research shows that actually that's a fairly vulnerable population. And it's a population that has a lot of money too. So it puts Why? You, why is that, you think? I think because logically you could maybe see your way through why some of these scams could be real or you know could result in something that might be helpful or you try and rationalize them. Whereas peop other people who might not have advanced degrees might have more street smarts and mm -hmm. be like, this is crazy. I wouldn't trust someone who just called me up out of nowhere and offers me all these opportunities. So it's so interesting you just said that right now because you know in, in the TED talk that I did, I'm gonna get into your TED talk soon. I, I I did talk about that too that sometimes being too smart doesn't work to your advantage. Yeah, because it it 
it, it, uh, it stops you or sometimes starts you to do things because you can, the rationale, the, the sure. ability to justify and rationalize things yeah. can get you into trouble or yeah. like you can, you know what I mean? I think you need to keep it simple sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's something, it's a life lesson. And the more mistakes we make when we're younger or things we've seen, the, the more aware we might be as we get older. Whereas if you've led a life where everything's logical and falls into place, mm -hmm. then you might be able to not see yourself you know, you know, thinking that these things could be bad things and you need to avoid them. So, you know, that's the cost of wanting to trust people or look, look for the best in people. Can you talk about some other myths that, you know, are out there that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the biggest one is, you know, memory declines as we get older. And I, I know that's not necessarily a myth, but I think it doesn't capture exactly what happens. And actually, I think what happens in our research really emphasizes this is as we get older, our memory becomes more selective. And one reason this is, is our metacognition. In fact, we're hyper aware that our memory is declining and we want to have some control over mm. it. So then we focus on the things that matter most to us. And we know we won't be able to remember everything. And then we focus on what we think is important. And I think that's a skill that younger people might benefit from. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and so this awareness and anxiety that might be associated with worrying about your memory can lead to this, in some cases, a very kind of savvy use of more limited memory. Well, yeah. And also I saw, I saw you did this and I think in your TED talk, maybe was it that, you know, if you, if you miss 10 minutes of the, of the beginning of a movie and you yeah. ask your kids, they'll like give you every like little detail about what you yeah. missed, which exactly. is probably not much, right. but you ask your wife and she's like, you missed nothing. Right. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you are able to also like pick the information that's important better, right? Exactly, yeah. And yeah. I think as we get older, we're better at sifting through what's important and what isn't. Yeah. And kind of, you, we, you know, often we're worried about forgetting things, but forgetting can have some adaptive value because we do want to forget, discard things that we don't need. Right. Whereas when we're younger, we're sponges. We're picking up on everything and everything could be potentially important and used at some point in the future. Right, right, so right. So I think right. that might be, in a sense, what wisdom could be as we get older is kind of figuring out what do we need to hold on to? What do we need to work with? What can I kind of tuck away for later? What can I offload to either a device or to a friend or spouse? Right. And as we get older, we realize we can't remember everything. But when we're younger, that's not so much of a challenge. Absolutely. Uh, what are some, some tricks that we can remember people's names or other things to help improve our memory? Yeah, um, it's probably the most common thing when people say memory. They say, oh my gosh, I have the worst memory for names. And the truth is, it's not that people have the worst memory for names is that names are by their nature very hard to remember. There's not a good reason someone's named David or Alex unless there's a good story behind it. So the way you can kind of trick your memory into remembering things is attach it to something you know already. So that's that's a mnemonic. So I always give people uh, the mnemonic that my last name is Castell. Yes. And I've told you this, it rhymes with pastel mm -hmm. and my great grandfather was a painter. So now you can kind of connect Castell to pastel and then you have the pronunciation. But of course, these mnemonics, you know, you kind of have to get creative. It's, yeah. it's hard to do, like, why Jennifer and not Jessica? And I know, that you keep on calling me Jessica <laughs> when I first exactly. meet you. So. And they lead to very predictable errors. And people will then say, oh, thank you, Dr. Pastel. You gave me that great mnemonic to remember your name. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if they're joking or not. But I can see, you know, the glimmer in their eyes that, like, I remember part of this because we had a conversation about pastels and artists and Castel. Um, so then you have a fighting chance. But I think... The truth is, um, I always think that, look, I might not remember your name, but I'll remember we had a conversation or that we met through friends and all these other things that to me are more important than your name. So as a memory expert, I have no <laughs> trouble saying, look, I study memory and I know why I forgot your name. You, you know, your name is also my sister's name, but which sister? And, and that's just how memory works. And um, memory doesn't work like a video camera. We don't have a kind of a, even though it feels like we might have a very detailed memory for something mm -hmm. that's happened in the past. Often this can be re reconstructive and, and small details change. The more we tell the story, the more confident we feel about it. Um, and one example I've, I gave as well in the, in the TED talk you mentioned is, just, you know, even if you see something hundreds or thousands of times, you yes. don't remember the details. In fact, you might even be more prone to forgetting them. And um, one example is the Apple logo. We've all seen it and it's on devices all over here. But if I asked you what side the bite was on, you might struggle to remember. Oh, I would have remembered. Right. I mean, how many people, what's the, what's the data on how many people remember 
without seeing it. Yeah, you you know? people are almost at chance. But then if I said, is there a stem or a leaf and, and which way might the stem or leaf point? You know, when we ask people to draw this, they're kind of all over the place. And then they'll say, well, look, I'm terrible at drawing it, but I, I know I'd, I know it when You'd I see it. You'd recognize it, exactly. it yeah. But then when we give them very much like a lineup with eight different alternatives that differ in terms of right. where the bite is and where the stem is, fewer than 50% get it, even though people are very confident. So that, I think, is a good illustration. No, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. That even, you know, of course you're going to forget names because you're forgetting things we see all the time. And, um, you know, memory, a human memory system is not designed like a computer memory system. And in some ways it's frustrating because we'll forget this or that. But in some ways I think it's unique and it allows us to kind of mentally travel back in time and re-experience something that happened 50 years ago. And that's one reason I found, you know, studying aging so fascinating is I had older grandparents who would confuse me for my brother, you know, yeah, 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 <laughs> and yes. get our names mixed up. But they could tell us, you know, how much the milk or lemonade was that they bought at the grocery store yesterday and how it was cheaper than it was last week and what store has a better deal. So clearly their memory yeah. is working at, at a level that to them is important. And, it, yeah, and why are they choosing knowledge. that? Yeah, is it because... You know, it could be that, you know, the era they grew up in, they want right. to save money or these things just stick. And I think it's the same, whatever you have expertise in, you're going to remember those things right. more in a more detailed manner than things that you're not so, you know, of course my grandparents probably cared about us, but of course you're going to get names confused as you get older. But it's interesting that it's not everything that just declines. In fact, there are some things that you know, better with age, or at least, you know, that you can selectively focus on because they're important to you. Right. Well, I think also like, you know, um, how much of it's personality, right? Like some people are just, mm -hmm. are there people who are paying attention more and they're trying to remember how much of it's sure. that or not just distracted doing a million different things? Yeah, I think attention is kind of the precursor to memory. Right. And if you're not paying attention, then you don't really have that chance to remember it. And in terms of personality, certainly that can play a role. I think there are some people who are just curious and yeah. they're curious about different things and what interests you might not interest me. And, and we did a study at UCLA looking at this idea that kind of curiosity guides memory. And we presented people with different um, statements and asked them to guess the answer, like what was the first product to have a barcode? Right. Uh, or wow. um, yeah. what, what country was the first country to give women the right to vote? And instead of telling people the answer, we asked them, how curious are you to learn the mm -hmm. answer? And then we had them guess and people made all sorts of mistakes. And that is another key to learning is kind of this errorful learning where you make a few mistakes and then you're given some feedback. So... Um, and then we followed up with these people a week later, or even a month later, and asked them these same questions. And it, it was the questions that people, older adults specifically, were most interested in that they later remembered a month later. Right. So they remembered the things that they were most curious yeah. about, but they forgot the things that they weren't interested in. Right. Whereas the younger people kind of just in general remembered a collection of stuff. Right. And so I think that shows that memory becomes more honed uh, in terms of curiosity that if we're interested in the barcode, we'll remember it. But a lot of people say, no, that's so low. I don't even I don't care. Yeah, I'll tell you it's Wrigley's chewing gum. And you're like, great. I don't even want to know that. Right. But if I told you it was New Zealand, who's the first country to give women the right to vote, you might say, oh, that's surprising. I would have guessed five other countries first. That's what you might remember a month later. And that's even more the case as you get older. So instead of it just being like a personality, I think it's like a selectivity that right. as we get older, we just become more honed or more specific in terms of what we want to know. Yeah. Or like, like you said, the, the things that we're curious about or we're genuinely interested in, yeah. you'll end up remembering. And I, yeah. again, I, I kind of feel that's like with any age though. It's not so <laughs> much with just older people. Sure. And I think it's probably true with, with a lot of people that if you're interested, it, it'll stick. But I think as we get older, there's so much forgetting. Yeah. And that those are the things that will actually stay, the things that you care right. about or like interested in. Yeah. How about like, are, how about the myths about um, that uh, as you age or as you get older, uh, why is it that they we wake up earlier, at, earlier and earlier <laughs> sure. as we age? Um, yeah. Why is it we get more set in our ways as we mm -hmm. age? Because these are things that like, you know, when people are like, oh, well, now she's too set in her ways for so-and-so, right? right? Why does that happen? Well, certainly um, circadian rhythms change as we age. And this is not true for everyone. But for the most part, when we're younger, our, our kind of optimal time of day is later in the day, mm -hmm. sometimes in the evening. If, you know, college students will typically stay up late right. doing a lot of studying. As we age, our circadian rhythms shift typically so that as we're, when we're older, we're, we're more, our optimal time of day is earlier in the day and sometimes in the morning. 
And studies have shown this when you test an older adult at their optimal time of day, they're doing as well as a younger adult at their non-optimal time of day. Mm. So these, these effects can be pretty big. Right. Um, and again, I noticed it with my grandparents who would be up at six or seven, right. and, uh, call me up and they've already done five or six things <laughs> and I'm barely out of bed. Um, but in terms of the habits, that's interesting because certainly as we get older, our habits might become more entrenched or pronounced. We've just had more, you know, we go to the same restaurant, we see the same friends, we do the same things. And th some of those habits can be beneficial. Like if you're going in the same coffee shop, you'll see the same friends, you'll have this kind of structure. Um, but that's not to say that as we get older, we always fall into these habits and we can't change. And a lot of older adults are interested in trying a new restaurant or often when people retire, they do want to take a new trip somewhere. Um, so it's not that you can just say like people are just, those are their habits and they right. can't change them. I think, I think we trust ourselves more. Uh, we, oh, we, we kind of know like, what we like. Yeah, yeah I was going to exactly. say, we know what we like, we right. know what we don't like. Right. But I do, I mean, again, maybe it's a personality thing, but then again, I think it can be the combination, right? Because even as I age and people I know age, like, you know, my mom or whatever, it's like you tend to want to do things that you're comfortable knowing that you like, they're not, sure. you're, you're more risk adverse yeah. as you get older. And it makes sense. You don't want to slip and fall. You don't want to get lost right. in a part of town that you're not familiar with. And when you're younger, taking those risks could be beneficial. You're kind of foraging and looking for new opportunities and mates. And right, so on. right, right, right. Exactly. But whereas I think when you're younger, it's kind of this selective optimization where you kind of know what works for you. You know, these other things might be risky. They might not be fruitful. Um, so why take those chances? And sometimes that can be frustrating if you're like, hey, mom, let's go do this or do this. And like, no, right. no, no, I don't do that. Or I'm, I'm not going to. And you're just at different stages in your life. And it's not to say what she's doing is a bad thing because she's restricting opportunities. It's just that, you know, she might not have the same resources you have, or maybe her knees are not as strong as they used to be. So she doesn't want to take risks that could be kind of result in things right, that could right, really right. limit her mobility. More from our guests, but first a few words from our sponsor. Well, guys, if there's ever a service that I need, it's this one. It's called Belay. And if you're like me and sometimes don't know or how even to begin to delegate your workload and you're spending a lot of time with hours that are not productive to your ultimate goal, this is a service and a company you need to look into, okay? Belay is an incredible organization revolutionizing productivity with their virtual assistants, their bookkeeping, and social media strategist services to actually grow your company and your organizations. You know, they learn that you can learn how to focus on productivity rather than the profits to actually have a much more successful company, right? Belay's Productivity Guide is a compilation of their most tried and true resources for actually mastering time, organization tips, delegation advice. I mean, guys, this is really a great, great service. Learn how to boost your productivity and accomplish more with Belay's resource, your personal guide to a productive work week. Visit belaysolutions.com slash habits to download it free today. That's Belay Solutions, B-E-L-A-Y solutions.com slash habits to download it free today. It's always interesting you say all of that, but then older adults might be interested in like reading a new well, book or finding a new movie. Absolutely, right? Because so. everything is everything is everything is relative, and yeah. it's not like uh, one brush to paint everybody. But right. I do find like, and you know, happens with me, happens with everybody I see. Like that, those are I kind of feel myths that are there's like some yeah. accuracy to them, right? Yeah, you know? and I think stereotypes often that's why they are stereotypes. There's right. some um, reason we have them, and they do fit. And, but it doesn't mean necessarily we need to fall into them. And, and sometimes that can be beneficial, but sometimes that's not the case. And, you know, one thing that I was caught that as we get older, we actually don't feel as old as our age. And that's kind of perplexing. <laughs> it's so true though. <laughs> but that you... can be cost and benefits. Like, so I think the research shows that after the age of 40, you tend to feel subjectively 20% younger. So, yeah. you know, when you're 50, you don't feel 50. You're like, I feel like 38 and 40. And so, you know, why is that psychologically the case? And maybe it keeps us young mm -hmm. and maybe it makes us, you know, do things that, you know, don't fit the age stereotype. Well, look at my knee, for example. Sure. You know what I mean? Not to keep on bringing up the knee. but <laughs> No, it's important. You know, but I'm telling you, it's like, I think I'm still 24 and I can right. do the same wear and tear in my body yes. that I did before. Yeah. And then I get 
I never got hurt back then, but now I'm getting hurt. Right? Or if you did get hurt, it heals really it, quickly. Exactly. Resi- so you're much more you're resilient. Not, yeah, you don't feel like it's risky to do those things. But I'm always caught when people say like, oh, you know, I had a back injury when I was 35 and people just said, oh, you're getting older. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, that's part of it, but I didn't feel, but I, I was probably doing things without stretching or kind of, right. you know, I was lifting car seats and doing things that I wasn't doing when I was when 25. When you were 25, right? right? So there's, there's reasons, but you know, with the knee, it's interesting because you could say, oh, it, it's just age, but your other knee is the same age. Exactly. So, <laughs> you know? Well, then I would argue it's because I'm putting more wear and tear on this one because it's it's overcompensating for a different injury. Absolutely. And I don't want to bore you with all the like rigmarole detail. No, it's fascinating. Detail, and and but, as you get older, actually, you'll notice people do talk more about their injuries oh, know. and they, they share because these things become more important. Whereas when yeah. you're young, you're like, it's a knee injury. Let's move on. Exactly. Ice it. You'll be better. But I think as we get older, you know, if you notice the conversations often, it's around like the weather or, you know, injuries yeah. or hobbies. Why the weather though? Just because I've often wondered, I think it's because it's common to everyone. It's a good conversation. Yeah. And it's also something we don't, naturally, it's very interesting. We don't have control over it. We might, you know, we is that both, why old people talk? We both about grew it? up in Canada. Yes. If you don't know the accent, yeah. so um, I, I think it's you know you have to take into account the weather here in sunny Southern California, not so much. But I think people, you know, um, I know my father-in-law will look at the weather in other parts of the country where his son is, and so on. So I think. Maybe it's just an interest in nature and the things we can and can't control. Or just something that you, it's easy, it's like accessible information. Sure. Is there um, any kind of research on people who live in cold climates versus people who live in warmer climates in terms of their aging or their memory? You know, it's always, you, you see a lot of these yeah. snowbirds moving from, let's say, yeah. New York to Florida, and there could be a million reasons for that. Um, I don't know if that could actually lead to any longevity. I think what is important when you make those moves is to make sure you're around kind of a social community that you connect with. And so a lot of people will move and then realize they had so many friends back home Mm -hmm. or they move because their friends have moved, which can be very healthy. Right. Um, or they move because grandchildren have moved, but that can, you know, then you realize, well, we moved for the grandchildren, but now we don't have friends around. So right, right. I think having a community around of people that you enjoy interacting with, whether it's swimming, playing golf, reading, cribbage, you know, anything, going to the senior center, those sorts of communities are important. And I think the actual weather, whether it's, you know, <laughs> warm cold or cold, or hot, yeah. might not play as much a role as we think it does. Is there a difference between longevity and aging? Because I feel, and it could be just my social circle or where I live mm-hmm. or whatever, there's an obs- there is an obsession now with longevity, like how yeah. to, you yeah. know, anything that they can, anyone can do to like seem and feel younger. They're yeah. biohacking the hell out of themselves, right? right? <laughs> like they'll do it. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of things that are, that are happening. Yeah. Um, I think aging has negative connotations, yeah. whereas longevity doesn't. So, so it's just a nice euphemism I, for in aging. In a way, but I mean, would you want to live a long life when 30 years of it would be in a terrible state where you're, you have mm-hmm. dementia? Or would you l- rather live a shorter life where you were relatively healthy? So I think we need to think of this in terms of kind of the meaningful years we have to live. Right. And talking about successful aging in some ways is... It's tough to know because what does success mean? It could mean different things. To different people. To different people. Right. So we want to make sure these are kind of meaningful years. Maybe to some people that would be productive years. Yeah. To others, maybe not. Um, you know, we don't just want to add years to our life. We want to add life to those years. Right. And I think that's probably the most important thing to consider when we think like, how can I age well, but also in a way that that's meaningful and, you know, keeps me happy um, and the people around me happy. So when you uh, wrote the book, Better With Age, uh, you know, the psychology of successful aging, what were you talking about then? Were you talking about that, about how to age with happiness and with health and... I mean, those are some things that were the pursuit of happiness is something we're all oh, interested in exactly. at every age. So I think really the point is not to be happy or healthy. I mean, hopefully those would be the byproducts of engaging in, you know, active lifestyle, being curious, being around the people you care about. But I really had to rethink what it meant to be successful at this. And and I interviewed many people for this book, including people like Maya Angelou and Bob Newhart, Jack LaLanne, John Wooden. It was Frank Gehry. It was a lot of fun. Those are, uh, I mean, you did interview amazing group of people. And was there one through line <laughs> through all of it? Well, it's funny. A lot of these you could say are anecdotes and these are outliers. Mm-hmm. These are not people, you know. Exactly. Um, but they all had different things to say. And, you know, some of them are happier than others. It's not just because they've reached fame that they were happy. In some cases, they were workaholics. I 
also interviewed a lot of other people who are just, you know, retired, happy, active, you know, a postal worker, you know, people, the more I started doing this, the more people would say, oh, you have to interview so-and-so who I know they're 94 and still doing this. Um, wow. So there were a lot of great interviews. Probably one of my favorite one was with John Wooden, who was the UCLA oh, yeah. basketball coach. And he was, I was always a fan uh, growing up in Canada, even of UCLA <laughs> basketball. So I'm just so happy to be here. And so I got to meet him and interview him. And he was amazing. I mean, just an Everyone incredible person. That. And he had lots of stories and, um, but you know, he had a busy calendar. It was hard to get a slot with him at age 94. I uh, met him a few times. Um, but he said, even kind at of, 94, at 94, he had a handwritten calendar and it was a busy calendar, people dropping in to see him, but he made time for me. And the irony was that the day before I was going to meet him for an interview, he called me the night before to remind me that I was coming really? that day. And I was thinking, this is amazing that a 94 year old wow. has to remind me and has the wherewithal to think about it. So, you know, the interviews in the book, kind of the highlights of it, but he said it comes down to kind of two things and this is what he said not just about aging but um the two most important words in the english language to him um and i should have you guess but i won't yeah. put you on this spot uh, yeah you could but go ahead he said the first one was love and it's really be around the people you love do the things you love and he had a long successful career his wife sadly passed away well before he did mm -hmm. and he would still write her letter every month he wouldn't sleep on her side of the bed so you know, he felt there was a tremendous loss there, but he had a huge extended family and players who would be visiting all the time. And the second word was, and he had me guess, that's why I was going oh, okay. <laughs> to, I completely struck out, but the second word caught me by surprise, but I think I guess? it's a great one. Sure, you can try and... Okay, the first is love. Yeah. Uh, community, I was going to say. It's definitely related to community, uh, but it's balance. And he said, you have mm. to find balance in your life, that there's not one thing. And, you know, work can be incredibly rewarding, but you have to balance it with family or other pursuits. And the balance is not just kind of this physical, this emotional or mental, but it's also physical. And one thing people don't think oh, about yeah, as we get older is um, after the age of 65, one in, one in three um, Americans are going to suffer a fall. And that fall can result in a broken mm. hip or collarbone. It happened to Wooden in his his apartment he fell in the middle of the night um going to the bathroom and broke his collarbone and his wrist he lay on the floor because he couldn't move and waited until the next morning until a caretaker came and oh. they took him to the hospital and he was lucky he could, How have, old was he he? could have died he was in his early 90s and that happened oh, and, that, wow. and it happens i mean it, it happens to many people but we don't really focus on it we think about oh memory you know we have to keep our memory sharp and really what we have to do is stay on our feet and in Wooden's case, mm -hmm. he was lucky. He even had a life alert, but he didn't use it. He didn't press the button because he didn't want to bother anyone. And so that's another barrier psychologically is that we might not want to admit or oh. cause you know, trouble to someone else. Um, so I always tell people, people talk about brain training and computer-based brain training and you know, how do I keep my memory sharp? Is it crossword puzzles? And I say, probably the most important thing you need to focus on is your physical balance. And you can practice this every day. And I, a great tip from an older adult who told me she brushes her teeth every morning, standing on one leg for one minute and then switches legs to the other. And, you know, instead of the treadmill, we should do the balance yeah. because if anyone tries this right now, if you stand up and try balancing on one leg, you might do it for 10 or 15 seconds. Then you notice you, you can't hold it and then try with your eyes closed. It's even more difficult. So then Imagine you're 50 or 60 and you're getting up at night and there's a carpet you might trip over or mm -hmm. a pet on the way to the bathroom, you lose your balance. We often can regain it. And those are near misses and they happen all the time. But when you lose your balance and you break your hip, you're in the hospital, that's kind of the first step towards less mobility, less independence, and ultimately death. Absolutely. And so it's kind of a scary thing to think about, but it's also something, again, we do have control over. If you practice your balance five to 10 minutes every day, it's probably more important than the crossword puzzles or the brain training or these other things. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know what, Sinch, because you're right. I mean, when people fall, older people fall and break a hip or whatever else, mm -hmm. that is the beginning to the end right there. Exactly. That's when it becomes, it's like a yeah. a quick rabbit hole down. Yeah. down. Because you lose your mobility, then you're in the hospital and then people have to yeah. take care of you, then you're not walking. And we know if you're not walking, your hippocampus might shrink, it might shrink. <laughs> your exactly. memory starts to decline. So all of these things I think are related. So when Wooden said balance, I'm not sure if he meant exactly in this way, but it's certainly a topic that I'm 
so interested yeah. in and I think we all need to be because when we say what's the one thing there is no one thing and we do need to find balance in our life and if you're doing a lot of running then you probably should do something else to balance it out the yin um, to the yang yeah, everything exactly and that's well, again with the knee but the truth yeah. is that's why right <laughs> yeah. because I was so hardcore on one sure. modality that I didn't yeah. recover or give myself that recovery yeah but there's always a need for that yin and the yang right yeah. so with balance yeah but you know what it's interesting because I'm sure a lot of these people like you said when you were interviewing them um and they were successful, quote unquote, mm -hmm. it's because a lot of them were workaholics too. Yeah, and so I don't think they were a role model for balance. And yeah. I think that's the struggle we all have because if we find something interesting and rewarding, we're gonna throw ourselves yeah. into it, the running, the you know our jobs and so on. And I think we learn, especially during a pandemic, how important balance is that even if we didn't like our commute to the office or all the other, it, it wouldn't be bad to have it one or two days a week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we could really balance things out. So I think we, in a, in a sense, this pandemic, for, for me at least, felt like a mini taste of what retirement could be like. like yeah. You still have a job and responsibility, but now you're all in one place and maybe you're not around the people that you're usually around. And at least for me, I notice how many of them are like my friends mm -hmm. and social circle that I have lunch with or see and bump into in the elevator. And when all of that's gone, you realize something's really missing. Absolutely. It's yeah. like also the gym, right? A lot of people yeah. are going to the gym. Yeah. I mean, it's not just to be working out. It's because you develop a social community there. Absolutely. You're seeing your friends. It becomes yeah. part of your daily, like, fun yeah. in a way, right? It's motivating. I mean, it's socializing. <clears throat> and socializing. It's kind of socializing in small groups. And maybe not for long periods of time. You don't need to go out to lunch with someone. Right. Seeing people at the coffee shop, the library, the community center can be very rewarding. And sometimes we underestimate that. So we do. if we move to another state or country or do something like that, you know, those can be some challenges as we get older. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a, a very, it's like a very true, it's a truism, right? Yeah. Uh, how about how about other things like some like key points or, or, or key learnings from some of the all the people that you yeah I mean it's actually, hard to summarize it all you know I try in this book to do that and I not think at that, all just another well, I, th I think the summary that I give people are the ABCs of successful aging because it's kind of more digestible and A can stand for attitude because yeah. if we have a positive attitude about aging we're more likely to walk or be around people who, you know, share you right. know, that positive Right, like like-minded people, like be around the five Although people. it's good to be around other people who have shared differences and opinions and so on, but you know the people who bring you down mm -hmm. or the people who, you know, don't bring out the best in you. So that attitude about aging can be important. Um, and then B is balance, like we talked about yeah. already, both physically and mentally. And I think the last one is kind of often forgotten is, is C for connection. You know, connect with the things you love that you find important, but also the people that you want to be around. Mm -hmm. And that connection can be important, you know, especially during a pandemic. How can you stay in touch? And not all of it is Zoom, whether it's writing a letter or, you know, making a connection with a new person, which can be very challenging, you know, during these times. But it's sometimes a person of a different age and sometimes older adults will enjoy spending time with someone who has complementary skills. Is there a way... Um and you were, you were saying earlier, and I think we got sidetracked about um, people people who are losing their memory, for example, in dementia. Is there a way to revert any any um, ways people can start reversing that besides what we talked about? Is there like yeah. foods that are besides all the stuff we always hear? You right. always hear about you know salmon and blueberries for yeah. memory and um, yeah. omega threes. Is there like any kind of new information out there I mean, that tough. we can glean that? It's tough for dementia, especially, you know, Alzheimer's, a form of dementia, is the most common because there's no drug, there's no treatment that right. really has proven to be um, helpful. So that's why I think everything we have to focus on is prevention. prevention. And I think if we've seen it happen to our parents or grandparents, that might make us more aware of it and more anxious. But I think there are things we can do, such as physical exercise, being around people, you know, playing music, listening to music, reading fiction actually can be mm. surprisingly good for your imagination and mind. Um, and, and these are things we can do that we might enjoy. I'm always hesitant to recommend like the salmon and blueberries and so on because <laughs> you hear that all the time. It's like yeah, the same thing I, I think over and over again. There's definitely benefits for these things, but you have to look at the effect size. Like mm -hmm. how much is it going to offset dementia for you who's already probably got a fairly good diet to begin with? And if you're just eating blueberries by the pound, you're losing balance, right? Like a balanced yeah, diet is right. probably more important than I'm going to eat blueberries for dinner 
instead of so i think you know finding finding the right amount so balance in every part of life right and how you eat i think and so, how you yeah, physically I think how physically active you are how much you work to yeah. how much you socialize with friends yeah. and family because i think it's like a portfolio like you don't want to focus just on one stock because that stock could tank yeah and maybe the research shows this in mice that never eat blueberries they get this big benefit but if you're already having a fairly right balanced diet like walnuts they say right. great for or even brain. coffee comes and goes and red wine too a lot of these are correlational mm -hmm. studies so we don't know what causes what right so you know sometimes the red wine one is if you're having one to two drinks of red wine a week it might be because you're doing it socially with other people and maybe it's the social component mm -hmm. and then the, the red wine is a part of that that can really lead to longevity so we it's really it's hard like chicken to know. or the egg you don't know it's hard to know but i think if we don't know you should hedge your bets don't start drinking red wine because one study told you two cups a week is what you need but if you're drinking you know if you're having social interactions and a glass of red wine is part of it that's probably not such a bad thing so is there any kind of supplements or like uh, that you would recommend? What do you think of like omega? We all hear about the omega-3. Is there anything yeah. that we don't know about that you're you like, know, you know I, this is a great, yeah. not to say, I know you're, I started the yes. podcast by saying what yeah. I love about you, Alan, is you're not about like, here, take this magic pill. And this well, is Well, I'm like, also, you know, a, you know a, but, a research psychologist. Yeah. So if I was a medical doctor, I might have more insight as to what deficiencies or what the latest thing is. Um, but, but I'm not. And I also feel like a balanced approach is, you know, if you are missing some things, you could benefit. Like if you're, you know, if you're vegetarian or if you're doing this, maybe that's something you want to rethink as you get older. Like, is this diet going to suit me well in the next 10 years of my life? And maybe it will, and maybe it won't. But I think that sort of balance might be important to consider. Um, is there any kind of information again that from people, all the people you interview that they were that they swore by doing this X thing <laughs> that kept them young or kept them from uh, aging, you know, rapidly? Yeah, you know, things? Bob Newhart told me you have to have a sense of humor, and I think that's the one commonality I saw among everyone. And you know, this is from comedians who I interviewed to the, you know, the most serious person you'd interview. That right. you have to realize that taking things with a grain of salt and knowing you don't have control over everything. And having a good laugh, I think that's something people especially appreciate as you get older. And when you're younger, maybe you're more serious or concerned or uptight. Right, right. Um, and as you get older, you can certainly have those qualities. But I think we all appreciate a sense of humor and you're going to need it. You hurt yourself. Funny things are going to happen to you. Your body starts making funny sounds. Your hair starts growing in places <laughs> you never thought of. So if you can laugh about it a yeah. little bit and share that with others, I think that's Another important thing, people don't talk about loneliness because there's taboos around psychology and not feeling that way. But the more we talk about it, the more comfortable we are knowing other people feel that way or experiencing these challenges. So what can we do sometimes together mm -hmm. to ensure that, you know, we age well? And like you also said uh, earlier, like when uh, John Wooden fell, being not wanting to ask for help. I mean, mm -hmm. being getting comfortable with asking for help when you need it, right? Yeah, it's hard to do. I mean, yeah. I think we all strive to be independent and have control over what we you know, can do. And I think even if you give someone this opportunity to press this button for help, you, psychologically there's more to it than that some people might press that button very quickly yeah, and, yeah, many, yeah. and many times exactly i know some people like that exactly you know? i think i'm related to yeah. some, but <laughs> I, I think we also know people you could see that saying like no they don't want that or they don't want alexa listening into every conversation mm -hmm. and they don't want these things so i think it, psychologically that becomes very interesting how can we improve our lives knowing how people behave and that some people might behave in a different way right um you know, also a thing I saw in your in your book, and I wanted to ask you about it was how you how you um, reframe something is a mm -hmm. big indicator of how much you remember, right? Like yeah. the wisdom test versus yeah. the memory test. Our expectations and even the language we use, like right? People, you know, it's not fair to ask someone how old they are. But if I said, how young are you? Or you look very young, just reframing it that way makes us think differently about age. And, and studies have shown that when you give an older adult a memory test, there's something called stereotype threat. If I say you're, we're doing a study on aging and you're our older adult population and we're gonna test your memory right. and a younger person is administering the test, the older adult is gonna experience some anxiety which can impair their memory. And that doesn't account for everything, but it can, you know, if you change some of these things in a subtle way, say, now we're going to test your wisdom. And maybe instead of using a computer, it's a paper and pencil test. And maybe the person who's administering it right. is an older person as well. That reduces the anxiety and older adults tend to perform better. 
on the same test. It's right. still the same wow. objective memory test. It's just presented in a different way. So if, as a psychologist, I find that very important that our expectations really do matter. Well, I think reframing as a psychologist, right, is something that people talk about a lot with anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like how you, even someone's overall confidence, no matter what age you are, right? If yeah. you, how you reframe how you see yourself or what you're saying out loud and whatever else changes your perspective, the perspective around you. So that kind Absolutely. of falls in line with what you're saying. And so if we rethink how we think about aging, that might benefit you know, the next cohort. That yeah. if we don't think of it as something we want to avoid or something we should hide or, you know, gosh, this happened to my parents, what will happen to me? If we think of it, that it can be a positive thing if we're doing some of these things that, you know, mm -hmm. can, can lead to it, surrounding us with, you know, being around people who have positive energy, um, having expectations that we have some control over things, but not everything, having a sense of humor. Right. I think all of those things, you know, staying curious about the things we really care about, but also realizing we might not remember everything. Right, 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 <laughs> you know, right. right. That, that's okay You as remember well. the things that, you're, that are important to you. Exactly, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, am I missing anything with you? I know you're, <laughs> you, you said to me, on the on the way and that you are writing a new book right yes i mean it's it's after writing this book and it, you know it was i thought for me this is an important book because i really wanted to talk about aging but i think more broadly speaking i'm very interested in how people can see the big picture mm -hmm. and i think that's something that happens as we get older maybe as a there's a pandemic we right. start to say you know what's really important to me and so I, my next book is going to focus on those sorts of things that can allow us to see the big picture the bottom line the executive summary, like you said, yeah, like yeah, if, yeah. I, if someone said, well, what was the podcast about? It was an hour long. I don't want to hear the hour long version. Right. Why is it that some people can kind of summarize it in two or three minutes and tell them, go look at these other things if you're interested. Right. Whereas other people kind of struggle and, and remember some details, but forget the bigger overarching theme. So yeah. Yeah. It's something I struggle with. I think I, we all do. I know. <laughs> it's actually true. And you know, it's funny. Um, Again, like all of this is so relatable, right? Like I see myself doing it sure. as I'm age, as I'm getting older. Like you know, yeah. I'm like, oh, it was about this, you know, yeah. whatever, or, or just watch the teaser or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, where do people find more information? Your book is obviously called Better with Age, and it is it was a Wall Street Journal bestseller, wasn't it? It was featured in the Wall Street Journal, yeah. Time Magazine. It's available on Amazon. Um, it's still available on so Amazon. So if you're interested, that's where you can find Better With Age. Uh, I also have a, a website through UCLA if you're interested in the research we're doing. And I, I hope to be back again in a couple of years with a new oh book. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so when is that book coming out? Uh, as soon as I start writing it. Oh, geez. Okay. So I, it's I'm like still, still kind of enjoying some of the themes here and trying to, you know, take, take what I learned from writing the first book into writing another one. So, wow. I know it takes a long time. It does. And you're never sure if it's the right time. I know. Well, um, nothing's ever, you got to just do it. Yeah, and I think like, so and ultimately just put it out there because yeah. it's, like, you know, takes even after you write the book, it's going to take a year to get out. The oh, book, sure. You know? sure. Yeah. No, this this book was probably a seven or eight year journey. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, it's a great read and uh, better with age with um, Alan Castell, right? You got like it. Castell, you but did. Castell. There you go. Uh, there I just took one of your tricks. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, yeah. It was a real treat to have you here. Thank you for having me. And uh, definitely come back when you have a new book. I hope so. If I have another question about aging, I know where to go. You know where to find me <laughs> thank you so much thank you habits and hustle time to get it rolling stay up on the grind don't stop keep it going habits and hustle from nothing into something all out hosted by jennifer cohen visionaries tune in you can get to know them be inspired this is your moment excuses we ain't having that the habits and hustle podcast powered by habit nest <laughs>